everyone. Welcome back to the Earth on Survival Guide, a podcast for all disciplines, paths, players, game masters, and enthusiasts like Josh and myself. I am myself. With me is Josh. Hello, everybody. Actually, I'm Dan. Uh, but thank you for joining us. Um, we have a single topic to cover today. We are going to actually do a few things. And so all things aeronautical are going to start off with. So if you have any questions for us, we didn't get any emails in the past week or so, which is just fine with us. We figured the holidays kind of kept everybody in a nice little stupor. So um, on today's podcast, we will be discussing, as I said, all things aeronautical. We're going to talk about airships. So this is Travel and Bar Save Part 2, because we did uh, riverboats a little while ago. But if you have any questions for us, please feel free to email us at edsgpodcast at gmail.com. And we're going to tease something. We are going to bring up in a future episode right around the corner, two or three weeks away, maybe even a month away, is a discussion on astral perception, astral sight, astral sensing, all that stuff. Josh wants to get into the the differences involved. So if you have any questions for us about that, send them in. Yes, that way we can combine those emails with discussion. And that'll be the fun part. So we could eventually get there. Anywho, in the meantime, uh, let's talk about the airships and travel. I want to start off with a couple of uh, quick pop culture references, because I think that a case could be made where if you en- end up getting one of these or obtaining one of these, purchasing one of these, stealing one of these airships, the right kind, you could actually run your campaign with all of your players on the ship appropriately and you could base it off of any number of TV shows or movies where the entire show takes place on the ship. Okay. Can you think of any any pop culture references there, Josh? I have a small list. Well, the one that sort of comes to mind offhand, and it doesn't all take place on the ship. True. But Firefly. Yeah. <laughs> I was the gonna, ship is going to lead with that. The ship is an additional character. The ship is. Like there are some stories that revolve around the ship and things relating to mm-hmm. to to Serenity, and so that is something that you could take in terms of a of an inspiration for a game that might be based on uh, an airship, a, a smaller one, or something like that. Yeah, if you get just the right one. So here's a couple of of just TV shows we can kind of keep in the back of our minds as we talk about the airships or as the list that we're going to go through today. Red Dwarf. Oh, that's a good one. Star Trek. Mm-hmm. Clearly. Killjoys. Uh, I think Battlestar Galactica. Okay. The Orville. Yeah. And okay. Farscape. Oh, Farscape is a good one. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, a retelling of Buck Rogers. But still, there's just a few shows right there that we can kind of uh, use as as we talk about the ships that we're going to talk about. Maybe think about if this is the right ship to put your player characters on and have them roam about bar save in that fashion. So uh, like last time, we're going to start off kind of biggest or smallest to biggest, just because uh, canoe was the smallest we had in the last riverboat section up to the big old paddle wheel boats. And that's the order that they're listed in in the book we're referring to. It doesn't hurt either. So (laughs) Uh, right down the list, uh, right off the bat, actually, the airboat is the smallest type of airship capable of carrying up to five human-sized name givers or three trolls without undue strain. Has a crew size of one, which means it takes one person to operate the the airboat, and that's pretty much it. So what do you think? This is think basically a flying canoe or (laughs) rowboat. It's basically what it is. It is generally used as a little vessel that would be like a, a taxi service, maybe within A city like you might have in Jarrus or Trevar, you might have airboats that are used either by uh, the patrol or or watch to get from place to place. Mm -hmm. They might be used, you know, to basically ferry around and do some work around the the larger vessels in the shipyards and and whatnot. But they're not designed for long distance travel, much like a, a, a canoe or rowboat. They're somewhat limited. For larger airships, um, you might have uh, airboats on board as a kind of lifeboat type of situation. Yes. Or something like that, where you would have, say, a a galley or a galleon, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but that might have an airboat on board as kind of like a captain's launch. If you think about larger seagoing vessels, is sort of the equivalent of that. They might have a small 
skiff or rowboat or something like that that could be used to go ashore uh, in that kind of situation. So an airboat could also serve that role. And I love the base price. You actually could, if you get enough silver in your pocket, purchase one (laughs) at 16,500 silver market There are prices that are listed. We're referring to the... um, Red Game Brick Master classic. Compendium, the the Red yes. Brick, the Classic Edition. There are prices that are listed for the vessels, for some of the vessels in those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not sure where thing? those prices came from. came from. They, you know, might be derived because I know in some of the, the first edition material, there were costs for repairs and whatnot that kind of determined the total value of the various game stats that were provided for them. And the prices might be based off of that Mm -hmm. because as we mentioned in the river boat episode, uh, we haven't really brought game stats as much for the, the vessels forward into fourth edition yet, because we're still trying to figure out what exactly the system for using them is going to be. And then, you know, we need to figure out how we're going to use them before we decide what kind of stats and numbers and things like that are going to be. Fair enough. So uh, you heard the the emphatic word there, yet. They're coming. <laughs> Eventually. <laughs> They're coming. So we're going to skip one in the book uh, to actually go with the small Drakkar, because it is actually smaller than a regular Drakkar, so just by size. Because the crew size on a small Drakkar is 15, and it's half the size of a regular Jakar, so it's very therefore smaller and faster and more maneuverable. But it's uh, it also uses messenger ships to carry urgent information quickly across great distances. So these are more of the size we're talking about. Maybe when we get to those pop culture references, kinda. Yeah, but it's a fast scout and patrol ship. Sure, the Drakars are modeled stylistically. Whether they're the smaller ones or or the the larger Drakars are kind mm-hmm. of stylistically modeled after the. Viking longships. Oh, yeah. Um, like that's the, the imagery that kind of goes along with them, which is to say it's a, it's a smallish vessel compared to some, Mm -hmm. but it is capable of traveling, you know, with, with its supplies and and whatnot of traveling decent distances. It's got the, the cargo and crew capacity to, to actually do that. Yeah. These are the vessels that are most commonly associated with the, the, the Highland trolls. The Crystal Raiders and the the trolls in other areas, but uh, Drakars could also be used if you're thinking of a more military style campaign, right? If you're looking at like Star Trek or Battlestar Galactica or something like that, mm-hmm. that the Drakar would tend to be more of the strike force, uh, the Defiant from Deep Space Nine, to mm. pull another uh, Star good. Trek reference. Um, would be probably more of a Drakkar style vessel than the Enterprise or whatnot, which would be more like a, a galley or a galleon where they are a much larger vessel. Yes. So that's Whole what you'd be looking at now. with a, a Drakkar. Uh, a Drakkar is probably the vessel that would be most likely if you're going to have a group that's going to have their own airship and you're not playing a game that is military based or mm-hmm. uh trade based or something like that the drakar is the the most likely vessel to be the one that a player character group might be based out of um because the crew sizes are small enough that you don't necessarily need to worry about you know a, a huge amount of crew or something like that but even the small drakar according to the mm-hmm. game stats in yeah. the, the book we're referring to has a crew size of 15 which means that even a a player character group which typically you know four to six characters yeah. is not likely unless they're all experienced air sailors or or crystal raiders with high mm-hmm. you know air sailing ranks are not going to be able to man that on their own generally speaking yeah. But this is where they can hire like three or four air sailors as a well if they're making enough I, money. I think the <laughs> and I did not review the old style rules to check, but no, I think either. what the crew size really kind of indicates is the minimum number of successful air sailing successes required in order to use the vessel. Hmm. So if if it has a crew size of fifteen yeah. Then you could man it with five experienced sailors who will typically get 
you know, excellent or better successes against the yeah. the difficulty six that um, was the default air sailing difficulty in previous editions. And I think it's yeah. still sort of assumed default in, in the current one. Um, and so you don't necessarily need 15 crew members, but if you have uh, that many, then people, you don't need to have everybody rolling really, really well in order to maneuver the ship. And you generally end up with better results and, and whatnot. Yeah. So, you know, the, the small Drakkar, the, the regular Drakkar, which shows a crew size of 30, those are the vessels that you typically would see associated with a, with a, an airship type game that is not necessarily focused on Fair. the larger ships. So if they were to, so the, the point of going through all the ships that we're going through today is how exactly would game masters use this ship, this type, this type of airship with their, game. So would they entice the players to acquire one or would they have to help navigate one and maybe take over another one from a raiding party or something along those lines? Or how would they, how would they incorporate this ship, this small Drakkar into a campaign? Well, I don't know that you need to entice players to go after an airship. (laughs) That's one of the, one of the big (laughs) questions that keeps kind of popping up with regards to airships is how do we get an airship of our own? <laughs> and, you know, we t- like we talked I about, want the, one. yeah, we talked about the, the price, like the actual sticker price, so to speak of the yeah. airships as presented in that book. But you yeah. also need to remember that there is probably upkeep and repair. There mm-hmm. is a crew that you would need to, to hire uh, okay. an airship is it's not, sweet. you know, it's not like fancy, crystal plate armor where you kind of pay a one-time cost and then you've got something awesome. There's, there's more that's involved Mm -hmm. and whether any airship is going to be of use in the campaign really depends on what the campaign is, is about. If it's not an airship focused campaign, then the, then the Drakars, the smaller vessels, if you're going to have an airship, I mean, you know, you mentioned it earlier, like it says, it's frequently a, a scout or messenger vessel. Mm-hmm. Um, because they do tend to be faster and more maneuverable. If you're going to be some some kind of um, – if the, the group is uh, doing a, a mission for someone of wealth and power, whether that's a, a noble house in Thrall or maybe even the, the crown or mm-hmm. wealthy merchants in Trevar or Jarrus or other places where airships are, are sort of common, that it might be that if they're – mission requires them to travel, they might have use, they might be given use of a Drakkar uh, to ferry them from, you know, one place to another. Uh, The adventure Terror in the Skies, which revolves pretty significantly around airships, there's the there's the main vessel that the group takes sort of initially, and then there's a Drakkar that kind of serves as a little like I mentioned, the the captain's launch kind of going uh, out and whatnot. Yeah. So, you know, at, at that point, one of the things that kind of happens with a lot of the the ships in pop culture references that, that we had referred to, mm-hmm. you know, whether Serenity from Firefly, whether Moira from uh, Farscape, the Defiant from Deep Space Nine, mm-hmm. you know, the Enterprise, you know, for, for Star Trek, whichever version, although with the Enterprise, it doesn't tend to be quite that so much, but that the ship, that the vessel becomes kind of a character in its own right that yes. it has a style and quirks and a temperament and whatnot that that kind of go along with that and so the a drakkar can certainly uh get that you know the the crystal raider drakkars the ones that are used by the the trolls in the twilight peaks and and elsewhere in bar save frequently are works of art in their own right. And that can give them a very, um, a certain atmosphere or feeling or mood about them. The, the Drakars that are used, for example, by the blood lore moot would be very different stylistically than the ones by, um, by say the iron mongers or the, or the sky touchers, um, or something like that. And that can be something that plays into the themes or mood or style of either an adventure or a campaign arc or something along those lines. So, Okay. I think those are the two that are uh, like acquirable for or can be acquired if they wanted to possess one. Uh, so now we get to the bigger, slightly bigger ships that are uh, different 
uses for a campaign uh, by the game master. So the regular size Drakkar, a typical Drakkar measures about to 20 yards long. So times three, 60 feet. And uh, 15 feet wide, so five yards. Banks of oars, sometimes a single mast for a sail. These are, uh, eh, price guide, you know, about 50,000 silver, so good luck. But um, this has a crew size of about 30. So this is a much larger ship. This is what, uh, I know the Crystal Raiders car. So this is about the size of what Crystal Raiders would be using. So... Dozens of trolls because the crew size is at least thirty. So mm-hmm. that's that's a that's a ton of trolls on there to k- lug around. Yeah, these are the larger ones and and probably a bit more styled after the Viking longships because of the Crystal Raiders and their association with that kind of cultural style. And they frequently will have weapons of some sort mounted on them. We won't even really get into to weapons that much. No, but no, not uh, so much. yeah, these are this is where we start to get into situations where spear guns, net throwers, uh, fire cannon, less frequently with the troll vessels, but you know you start to see them being able to be used on ships like this. Yeah, so these are all just uh, as we said, uh, rescue ships, messenger ships, or these are attack ships. So none of these really are commercially available to take you from place to place unless you bargain with a captain or something along those lines. Or like I said, you acquire the airboat, you acquire the small Drakkar, uh, or you can, you know, sweet talk your way onto a, a crystal Raider <laughs> or help yeah. them out in some way, shape or form, which uh, is doubtful. So on to the next one, which is the galley 30 yards long, six yards wide, nice and streamlined, like a 747. This is typically in the fleets maintained by cities uh, for shipping goods. So these have sails as well as oars, uh, good speed, pretty good maneuverability, but they're really there to transfer stuff and people from one place to the next. Uh, Some of these have fire cannons. Good luck buying one because I think a city has to pay about 150,000 silver to have one produced for them. Uh, This is the most common, as you say, commercial vessel. Um, outside of the the Drakkar for Barsavian ships, this is what you would typically see. And there is probably a, a wide variety of hull designs and styles and things like that, that that you would have. You could have things that basically look like the equivalent of a flying three-masted schooner type vessel. You can have ones that are maybe a little bit more fantasy, steampunky kind of look. I mean, without the the steam, but if you look at some of the art of airships in, in some of the Earth on things, like they'll have this really long extended like rudder thing hanging down below. Oh, yeah. And having some really kind of somewhat unusual hull designs because they're largely driven by magic and don't necessarily need to adhere as well to the realities of fluid dynamics that waterborne vessels would. <laughs> But these are the ships that basically run the major trade routes between the major cities. Yeah. And also most of the warships uh, are equivalent to galleys as well um, in terms of what they've got. Yeah. The combat vessels of uh, Thrall and any combat vessels that, that might exist as part of the fleets of other cities, although those would tend to be merchant vessels kind of pressed into military service uh, and would not be as dedicated to combat as, uh, as say, the, the Royal Navy ships would be. Yeah, because we didn't mention the crew rating. The crew size on a galley is roughly about 100, and it can carry about 150 passengers or a ton of cargo. Uh, and some mixture therein. About 20 years ago, there was a comic book put out by a company called CrossGen. They were in business for about five or six years, and they had one title called Meridian, and that actually had two warring um, nation states, and one produced airships. And so I fervently read that for any kind of inspiration and visuals to use for uh, anything I was doing with Earthon because I, I beg, borrow, and steal ideas where I possibly can. So uh, if you can dig up old copies of that, I recommend it just because the airships there, again, built on kind of the same uh, watercraft designs, but had some neat stuff to go along with it as well. 
the plot didn't really center around the ships, but it was nice to have in the background and how they built things. So very cool to use. So this is mostly probably what people would charter from one place to the next if they if they needed quick passage somewhere. Yep. That that would be accurate. As we kind of talked about in the riverboat episode, travel by merchant airship is going to unless you're willing to really, you know, shell out to commission a specific trip somewhere. Yeah, uh, if you've got the money to actually do that and to cover the costs of like hazard pay and all that sort of thing. The most likely use of galleys in terms of just travel is to go from, you know, basically along major trade routes. And it is probably not unlikely for a galley to perhaps have a, an airboat on board, like I mentioned earlier, as a as a captain's launch or something like that. Mm -hmm. That if the passengers were not necessarily going to the final destination, but were getting off somewhere along the way, that they might get, you know, run off or or dropped off by by airboat that kind of catches up with the vessel. One of the problems with airships is because space and car, you know, cargo space is at a premium because these are expensive vessels <laughs> with um, <laughs> somewhat limited uh, capacity compared to a, yeah. a waterborne ship. It is expensive to bring mounts uh, on board and especially loading and unloading mounts from airships. Yes. Can be difficult. So that is something to keep in mind as well. This is kind of where I equate uh, airship travel in Earth Dawn with uh, the 747s we have <laughs> today. Yeah. In, it's limited space. It's pretty expensive. Getting your, your pets or whatnot on board is also kind of a hassle. And that's just – there's an analogy to be made there, but it, it's not a perfect one. I understand that. So just, just – Well, and going, and going between the major population centers. Yeah. Like you're not going to get a 747 – at your little airport. In a puddle hump, you know, puddle jumper jaunt from exactly to to a little regional <laughs> spot. You're you're going, you know, between Boston and New York and generally for longer stretches because even like a a Boston to New York jaunt is not going to be done in a large plane like that. That's going to be a, a coast to coast or an international journey. Yeah, that's a big thing. So anyway, like I said, that's, that's just kind of how I think of it. My uncle used to work at the, uh, at the airport as a ramp rat. So I have something there and my dad used to repair planes. So, uh, every once in a while I have those as associations to make. So on to the galleon. Yep. The galleon, the galleon is pretty rare actually yes. in, it's in bar save officially, officially mm -hmm. there are only maybe half a dozen galleons total. If that I think that, like, I know in the old, um, I think it was in the original Thrall source book, there was an adventure hook about the air galleons of Thrall, that they had like two or three that they put into storage before the Scourge, and part of the adventure is to, like, and their location was lost or forgotten or something, and part of the, yeah. like, the goal of the adventure is to go and recover them. This is part of building up the military strength to go up against the uh, the Therans. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's possible that Thrall, it might get mentioned somewhere, that Thrall has commissioned a galleon to be built. Um, and so these are these are the, the, the flagships. These are the really big, these are the military vessels, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to the galleys that are kind of pressed into it. These are the ones that are designed for combat, uh, this is, uh, to draw the pop culture equivalencies, the Galleons are like the Enterprise or the Galactica. Yeah. These are, the the ship is still maybe a character in a sense, but it is less so a character and more of a thematic location that yeah. a group, a mobile location that a group is is based out of. That typically they will be using that to. to get from place to place, but going mostly going ashore, so mm -hmm. to speak, to uh, to have their adventures and, and whatnot. And if you're going to be dealing with a galleon, for the most part, you're going to be dealing with a military game. Uh, unless you're doing something a little, you know, obviously 
when you're coming up with with your what's going on in your own table, you can do stuff different. But sort of in the official continuity, if you're dealing with galleons, you're dealing with the Throlic Navy and everything <laughs> that goes along with that, whether the characters are freelancers that are being hired by the Navy and maybe going along as part of a mission or, you know, actually part of the Navy itself, mm-hmm. maybe as a, a command crew or officer crew or something like that. Um, there's a, a interesting possibility of a game, you know, where the the characters might be sort of senior staff on an airship, the same way that you've got the senior staff on the Enterprise. Yeah. And, and what can go along with that. And also because they have such a large crew requirement, both the galleon and the galley, you're looking at plenty of potential NPC reservoir for interactions and uh, interpersonal dramas and all of the sort of stuff that uh, that can go along with that. Totally. I actually played in a campaign. A friend of mine was running Earth Dawn, and we started off with brand new characters. And what we ended up finding was a we we exca- began to excavate a, a galleon that had been buried under the earth. But it, the the twist was is that it it was buried upside down. So we explored everything from the bottom up, literally. Um, but it was very fun to do. So we were in, we were interested in getting that part taken care of because this is a big, big ship. This is usually like a triple mast, two oar decks. Uh, like we said, crew of two hundred. This is you know fifty yards long. It's one hundred and fifty feet, uh, ten yards wide. It can carry up to twelve hundred troops if that's all you're going to carry. So it's a really big ship. So that was our, our care delving was not actually in a care. It was in a overturned galleon, uh, diggered into the earth. So we had fun with that one. That was very nice. It can't hold 1200 troops. It can't. Where did I get the that thing from? that I'm reading says an oh. air galleon can carry up to 230 troops. I think you I'm might sorry. be reading. <laughs> it was 230. My parentheses sucked. It looked like a one. <laughs> oh. I had a parentheses around okay. that number. I'm sorry. Well, Mike, 200 it's, troops. I mean, it's a that big was a ship, lot. Sorry. But 150 feet, you're not fitting 1,200 people onto a 150-foot no, vessel. No, that was my fault. I My handwriting on that note was uh, horrible. So I apologize profusely for that. My mistake. So, but that is, by the way, the last of the wooden built yeah, ships. Yeah, so the ships that we've talked about so far are all kind of based on the law of similarity, which mm-hmm. is that they're – Ability to fly is as a result of enchantments that basically allow them to treat the air as if it were water. And so that requires them to resemble water vessels so that they behave in a similar fashion as a result of the enchantments. And what this kind of means as well is that if they get damaged or whatever, they will list or founder or slowly sink the same way that a that a that a waterborne vessel would. The next group of ships that we're going to be talking about, (laughs) the Theron ships, the stone ships, are, you know, to to kind of borrow from Douglas Adams, um, fly in the same way that bricks don't. (laughs) And that basically they are a demonstration of the raw magical might of Thera and their ability to basically enchant a rock to have it float in the air. Yeah. And that rather than being brick. driven by the mental ritual of rowing or sailing the same way that you would a water vessel, mm-hmm. these basically, a lot of them, uh, certainly the larger ones, draw on the life force of the slaves that are used as their crew complements. Which is odd that I just recorded the story, The Brightest Star in the Sky, from the uh, Earth Dawn, Legends of Earth Dawn, about a care that was... Go back and listen to that episode. Uh, <laughs> so, on to the transport vedette. Yeah. This is passenger and cargo transport, sometimes as a swift messenger ship, so roughly about the same size as a Drakkar, we think. Yeah, because the, the, the vedette is, is sort of like you've got the, the Drakkar, the galley, and the galleon as sort of the three tiers of the, of the Barsavian vessels. And then on the Theron side, you've sort of got equivalents for, for, most of those. The Vedette being the Drakkar equivalent, which is to say that it's decent size. Like the, the transport Vedette, for example, has a crew size of 30, which is the same as the standard Drakkar. Yeah. And it's, you know, roughly 
equivalent, but this is sort of like a barge uh, in a sense. It mm-hmm. is a stone vessel. They kind of tend to be shaped similarly to barges or or boats, but tend to not be quite so much works of craftsmanship and art the same way that Drakars are. Yeah. And they, you know, there's three kinds of vedettes that are presented here. There's the transport vedette, which is just kind of the general workhorse transporting goods and people and cargo and whatnot. And then there's the mining vedette, which is the same kind of ship, Mm -hmm. but basically designed to perform elemental mining. And so is reinforced to deal with either the uh, strong winds and weather and so forth associated with air mining or resistant to the fire and lava of death sea fire mining yeah and oh, actually sea. there are probably i didn't check this beforehand but i think because there is fire mining that is done out of trevar where they mm-hmm. send Miners, there's a whole section in the book about the fire miners of Trevar and all yeah. of their cool stuff. But I think they use sort of Drakars that are specifically designed for fire mining, which yes. is again sort of the the equivalent of that. Yeah, because it's the same size ship, just less crew. That way they can carry more stuff back with them. So, because the mining that, that is, you know, crew size of 20, that's the, it's the exact same size ship, but they have fewer crew quarters so that they can, again, bring back more. Or, or whatever they are mining uh, for that. And then the last one you mentioned is, a, is the military vedette, yeah. because it is, of course, Thera, and this sucker comes armed. <laughs> right. This is basically, this is the um, escort ship. This is the, the strike vessel that yeah. would accompany a Theron fleet um, because they are, you know, smaller. In, in, a, in a sense, although it's not directly analogous. Mm-hmm. The, the the military vedette is sort of like the equivalent of the 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 short range like the the short range fighter bombers or that sort of thing that would launch yes. off of a carrier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're they're larger. Like obviously, you think of fighters and they're you know whatnot. They're usually just like one or two man planes. Mm-hmm. But that that the but they're based off of a larger vessel. Yeah. Um, and the, the military vedette are sort of the escorts and fighters and more maneuverable vessels, like um, maybe more like a, a destroyer or something along those lines, if you're talking about modern Navy equivalent. I was thinking I this not is your, up on that, but this is your Memphis Bell. This is your B-17 bomber from World War II. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's, you know... Uh, um, you know, again, this where, you know, the difference being that the military vedette, um, you know, while it does have some air, sh- you know, air combat capability, yeah. also does have a pretty sizable crew complement of air sailors. Yep. That, that stone in the air somehow can get delivered to a location for. So, yeah, the military vedette could actually hold up to 100 troops with a crew size of 40. So this is, again, the same size as the, as the Crystal Raider Drakars just made out of stone instead. So it's therefore uh, more sturdier to be able to handle the combat and transport all the troops. So yes. this is your big, swift, um, bad mamma jamma there. So onto the Kila, the massive yes. floating fortress built by the Therans. It's more like a flying castle than a traditional airship. It's 70 to 80 yards wide on a specific side. So, um, it's probably just about as big as the inner ring of the Pentagon. If you wanted to go look that up, <laughs> yeah, it's freaking huge. where the, where the military vedette is like the, the destroyer, mm-hmm. the Kila is like the battleship or the carrier yes. of a modern naval thing that it's the really big, this is your gunship. Yeah. This is, this is sort of your, <laughs> your gunship. Yeah, because the crew size is 170, uh, can carry a full Theron cohort of 480 soldiers. So when this thing shows up, it's on. Yeah. Going to say. And they've got significant firepower in addition to the, the you know, actual troop complement. They typically have notable firepower when it comes to fire cannons. And because it's basically a, a flying castle. Mm-hmm. It can bring a, a lot of power to bear, and this is 
sort of the 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 Kila is the flagship around which sort of the Theron fleet movements are tend to be based, yeah. with a, an exception that we will get to shortly. But basically, like a uh, you know a, a Theron naval detachment is probably going to be a Kila with an escort of a couple of military vedettes along with it, and its purpose is to kind of go to a location and land like bombard and land troops yeah you know that 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 the vedettes would kind of be based out of or off of it in in a certain regard yeah so let's go back to the vedettes real quick so how would you work in for your campaign or suggest a game master work in your campaign uh, their campaign any one of the vedettes the mining vedette i think is pretty pretty obvious uh they'd have to go you know, do some mining. Duh. Uh, but the transport vedette perhaps are traveling between cities into Thera. Yeah. Possibly. I mean, that, that's, I mean, at, at, so you've kind of got two options when it comes to these. One is if you are running more of a, a Theron campaign, whether mm-hmm. you are doing things in other provinces or having a game that is, you know, still in bar save, but a, a Theron based group then the vedettes would largely serve the same kind of story role that Drakars would in a Barsavian game. Yeah. That, you know, the transport vedette would be the the vessel by which groups might be moved from location to location and, and that kind of thing. So that's one option, mm-hmm. because obviously you're going to encounter these a lot more in Thera or other more Theron-controlled provinces like Crayana or, or uh, you know, Theron strongholds in um, Marak or Vasgothia or whatever. The flip side of that is if you're going to be running a more traditional game in that the player characters are Barsavians and that the Therans are ostensibly antagonists in some regard, that the Vedettes are likely to be something that is a target uh, mm-hmm. of an adventure where the group might be going after a Vedette that is transporting important people or intelligence, or material. Mm -hmm. It's especially um, if you're going to be doing a game that is perhaps based around the activities uh, leading up to the Second Theron War, like after the landing of the the Triumph, Mm -hmm. um, and working perhaps with the Life Rock Rebellion and and so forth. That's something that can still be done in a post-Second War uh, situation, but the Therans have a much smaller military presence at that point. So it's maybe a, a, you would certainly at that point be a lot more likely if you are dealing with Theron airships to deal with vedettes as opposed to Kilas, uh, because the, the Therans have, have pulled those ships pretty much out of bar safe. Yeah. Again, officially. So at, at that point, you know, maybe the vedette could be the, the target of something, you know, whether someone is, is being transported Certainly the the slavers that are associated with the Therans, um, if they've got any kind of airship capability, would be using vedettes to transport the slaves. Um, so that could be something, again, to, to kind of serve as a, as a target or an objective or something along the way of, of yeah. an adventure story. If you're like if you were running a, a Crystal Raider style game, if you're running a, a, you know, that kind of thing. Vedettes would be a very common target, especially the mining vedettes working Death's Sea and whatnot would yeah. be a very common target for, for Crystal Raiders to go after. Or, um, and, and another possibility is, you know, there's a legendary item that may have been held by somebody who's on one, and that item crashed out of the sky during the war, find it and find the item. Something along those lines. It could be at the bottom of a lake. It could be, as again, you know, diggered in and covered up with, you know, mounds and mounds of dirt, earth. Yeah, so, there's, um, there's a... Um, also, the possibility, if you're going to be doing maybe like a, an espionage style game, again, kind of an against the Therans, um, mm-hmm. if you could secure a vedette and use that in, in kind of like the way that the rebels used the Imperial shuttle in Return of the Jedi. Oh, yeah. As a, as a, as a camouflage way of, of secretly getting forces from one point to another. Uh, that's, you know, that's a possibility as, as well. Totally. Because uh, I think that brings up the Star Wars reference that the Kila may not be the death star but it's no, darn the close. is not the the Kila is not the death star <laughs> the Kila is not the death star the Kila would be sort of the um the the star destroyer i guess if you're kind That's of looking right. at the imperial okay. the imperial ships yes 
you know, that you that it's it brings a lot of firepower to bear. It is a powerful vessel. Yep. There's a there's a pop culture reference of a of an iconic sort of ship, the Millennium Falcon. Yeah. Um, is one that, you know, a, a ship that has a lot of character and kind of serves as the mobile base for our for our heroes. Totally. But yeah, the Kila is sort of like the 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 star destroyer of the um of the Theron contingent, which is to say it's got a lot of firepower and can carry a lot of troops. And when it shows up, um, you things really don't are, want to see it in the sky. <laughs> yeah. Things are, are not great. Yeah. They're, they're not going well. So on to the actual death star, um, to use our reference here, uh, <clears throat> the behemoth, cause there is only one. And uh, to quote, well, there's only one, there are, there are a few behemoths. There are not many of them. Mm -mm. There are a few. I think the Therans in the Theron empire book, it mentions that they've got six or seven. Yeah. Something like that, that they, I mean, they have a few, but Mm -hmm. the behemoth is the superstar destroyer. It is the death star. Yes. Um, It is like the, the Kila is a flying fortress. The behemoth is a flying city. (laughs) Yeah, it's gargantuan. It is it is very large, very powerful. You know, the fact that the Theron Empire, one of the most mystically potent forces in the world, only has maybe half a dozen of them. Yeah. Um that when they were decommissioning one, they basically said, Well, we're gonna land it in this strategically important location because now that suddenly gives us a fortress. Yeah. Huge tactical advantage. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the, the, the Kila can kind of do that as well. Mm-hmm. That if you land a Kila, you suddenly have a, a fort, you know, an, an easily defensible fort that doesn't require you to do all of the digging and fortifications and construction that a fort yeah. actually would. It's a castle, just, you know, add water, instant castle. But, but the behemoth, but the behemoth, is, behemoth add water, is instant city. <laughs> yeah, the behemoth sort of in Barsave's reckoning, the fir- the behemoth first showed up and at the Battle of Sky Point, which was basically the 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 moment where the Therans declared that they were an empire and Barsave was its first province. Mm-hmm. That the during the Orichalcum Wars, the Crystal Raiders were doing all kinds of raiding and ca- disrupting the Orichalcum trade and causing problems for Theron shipments, and the Therans basically uh, told them to stop and the trolls told them to get stuffed and the Theron said, well, okay, then <laughs> rolled up their sleeves and basically sailed a mountain at them and leveled an entire moot. Yes. And, you know, like that was one. And then the next time one showed up was basically in, in, in the prelude to war supplement. Yeah. That like the dra- like the Therans lost a behemoth to the dragons during the Orichalcum Wars or during the, you know, the, the conflict with the dragons. And it took multiple dragons to take it out. The behemoth is not something that you <laughs> screw around with. No. Yeah. So that being said, uh, since an assault was launched upon the Death Star and people did infiltrate Star Destroyers and so forth, how would you incorporate a behemoth into your, I mean, this has to be like a different kind of care diving, but there's still people walking around that are living. So if you're going to send your party into the behemoth. Yeah. I mean, at, at that anyway, point, the, you know, the behemoth, I don't think can be necessarily treated as a vessel the way that Drakars or galleys or vedettes or even Aquila to a certain extent. Yeah. Could, could be that, that the behemoth is a location. It mm-hmm. just happens to be one that can move geographically. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, it's got it's got a crew size of of 250. It's got, you know, that's that's the crew that actually sails it. That's the, the yeah. you know, how many slaves and whatnot that are required to kind of keep it going. Power but it's and, yeah, I mean, at that point, you 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 get prelude to war and mm-hmm. you look at the information on the behemoth in there and what gets used that the yeah. behemoth is a campaign shifting thing. Mm-hmm. When a behemoth shows up or when a behemoth is involved, you are looking at a, a very significant devotion of Theron resources that it is. It indicates that what they are doing, they consider to be extremely important. Yeah. And your your five person uh, campaign is not necessarily going to take it out of the sky. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I mean, that could be a long term campaign goal. That would be yeah. something that would be that would be really kind of cool. Mm-hmm. But 
again, you are free to do what you want in your own game, but a, a behemoth should not be something that just kind of casually shows up. That needs that needs a long lead time. You need to build up to that as a possibility. Yeah, well, you need to build showing. up to that. You know, again, the arrival of the triumph, the behemoth that lands on the shores of Lake Ban, yeah. basically kicks off Prelude to War, which is a province shaping mm-hmm. series Event. of events. Yeah, and you know the the things that kind of come about as a result of that, and it's a permanent. I mean, because it was being decommissioned. And mm-hmm. after they landed it, they pulled the elemental air out of the hull, so it's basically never going to fly again. They basically landed a small town <laughs> on the shore of the <laughs> on the shore of the lake, and it's now a a effectively a permanent fixture. Yeah, they planted the their landscape. flag and they evacuated. So done. So I don't I don't have much advice except to say, look at what was done in Prelude to War. And that is the kind of thing that, you know, ends up involving a behemoth. If you're going to have adventures revolving around a behemoth, whether that's the triumph or Mm -hmm. some other behemoth that you bring into your game, you know, you're looking at an assault or infiltration on a fortified enemy position, whether it is on the ground or in the air. There are going to be a lot of troops. There are going to be, you know, experienced officers and that sort of thing. Like and the over you know, the over governor of of Barsave mm-hmm. had Aquila as his personal vessel. He didn't have a, a behemoth. Yeah. Again, the the Death Star comparison is kind of <laughs> apt. <laughs> I agree. That's why we I stuck my foot in my mouth and said the Aquila was the Death Star. Then I forgot about it. And then yes, the behemoth is actually the Death Star because that sucker is huge, and that is a big, big object to throw at people because, again, it's the size of a care or twice the size of a care. And so if they're going to infiltrate it, you better have some plans uh, as far as floor plans, fortification plans, troop plans, magician plans, all these plans you better have, you know, well laid out uh, if if you're going to demand that your party somehow go into there and try and make it back out of there. That is not, uh, yeah, don't throw a behemoth in there lightly. It's not something to trifle with. So do you, you want to talk about ghost ships? Well, ghost ship is sort of given its own category in this list. Yeah, but really what it. a ghost ship is, is another airship that, you know, is an airship of a certain type that has, for one reason or another, suffered some kind of catastrophe or some kind of problem where it's still airborne. It's still flying around, but the crew is dead or corrupted or undead or whatever and kind of causes problems the um sort of um the the obsidian flyer in terror in the skies could sort of be classified as a ghost ship Mm. you know just because of the of the role that it plays um if you want to kind of talk about ghost ships there there's at, at that point that's a that's a story with a ghost ship you you you're looking at a story of how, you know, what was it before? How did it become the way that it is? What's the problem that it's causing that the group is going to be dealing with? Whether that is just an adventure situation mm-hmm. or whether that may be a, a a campaign arc where they might need to learn about the ship and its history and things like that in, in order to overcome the problem that it solves. This is one thing we actually hadn't mentioned so much with, with airships, less so the case with riverboats. Yes. But airships, because of the nature of their enchantment, mm-hmm. are all named. That is something that is sort of required or at least understood as far as the, the magic that makes them work goes. And so Drakars and galleys and all of them, the fact, I mean, ships are traditionally named anyway, yeah. but these are named in the sense that they would typically have pattern items that you could learn things about, learn key knowledge of in order to gain power and influence over. And so maybe an interesting campaign arc would be if there's a ghost ship that's having problems, you maybe need to learn the actual name of the the ship, maybe track down pattern items that may have been Mm -hmm. lost from from the vessel into other places and use that uh, as a way to perhaps break the curse or, or bring an end to it. Of course, there's always, if you're running a game, you know, with, with a ghost ship, if you, you 
get a hire a, a galley or something like that to go and just kind of blow it out of the sky. <laughs> <laughs> Always a fun time. But yeah, the you know the ghost ships basically present adventure potential um, or campaign arc potential to deal with the the hazard that they. Uh, that they cause because airships, you know, were certainly around before the scourge with the amount of shipping and everything mm -hmm. and with horrors and other things that that might befall them. They're certainly something that could uh, that could crop up. Yeah. So uh, we hope this helps inform some decisions about uh, which ships to use when you're running a campaign or which ships to that you might be able to get passage on if you're a player in a campaign and inquire about prices. You know, we didn't talk about prices about passage because that's up to your game master and, you know, whatever. But we want to talk about the ships themselves and how they are a setting and story foil to be used in your Earth Dawn campaign because this is a large part of Earth Dawn is air travel and we have air sailors and sky raiders that are two disciplines associated with this kind of air travel. So we wanted to make sure we actually hit on it properly to kind of whet your appetite to use them more, explore them more and, or, you know, come up with some names for some really cool flying ships. <laughs> but, uh, otherwise any final thoughts on anything we didn't actually cover? No, I, except just to reiterate that when we had been kind of talking about pop culture, ships that a lot of times the the ship ends up being a character in its own right a, a location that has atmosphere and flavor and whatnot and you know you compare the homey kind of patchwork sense of the millennium falcon yeah to the sort of sterile military straight lines and flat bulkheads of the Imperial shuttles or star destroyers or, or that sort of thing. And you can use that as a storytelling tool, as a, as a way to set atmosphere mm -hmm. or expectations. Um, and when you're dealing with vessels as well, if you're going to have a, a, a adventure or whatever, that's revolving around a ship, that ship is going to have a crew and those NPCs can be varied. Again, one of the, the sort of secondary, subplots or or things in terror in the skies mm -hmm. is dealing with the crew uh that you work with you know alongside in addition to sort of pursuing the missions there are crew that come along with you on that and dealing with those relationships and and so forth it's all uh you know you get it you get the people living together uh in a smallish space and so there's all sorts of potential drama that can arise from that. <laughs> Absolutely. So folks, uh, thank you again for your time. Hope we answered some questions for you or inspired you to use uh, more air travel uh, of any kind in your campaign, or at least ask your game master if they want to use it in their, in your campaign. Um, you can contact us. If you have any questions or stories about uh, you know, questions about airships or stories that you want to tell about uh, cool airships, oh, we'd love to hear them. Use appearing in your game. Um, send us an email, edsgpodcast at gmail .com. Don't forget as well that we've got the episode coming up here uh, where we'll be talking about astral sensing. Yep, and all of the kind of getting into the weeds on that <laughs> a little bit. Uh, so send your your questions or comments about that so that we can have those accumulated and, and maybe address some common questions that appear. We're doing a lot of weed traipsing this year. Traipsing into the weeds. <laughs> We've covered the basics. Now it's time to get into the weeds. Get into That's the weeds. That's okay. Uh, until next time, folks, it is time for you to go sail into your own legend. Good night, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>